afraid I'll rise up And I'll do it a thousand times again For you Good afternoon. Happy Saturday, everybody. Thank you for joining us again for the March Impactful Conversations with Gail Guest Brown. Today's theme is courage. Where do they get it? You know, I mean, this courage. We'll be talking about the courage to run, the courage to run for per, uh, public office. And we've got uh, a great group, uh, two beautiful Black women here to, that have found the courage. We'll be talking to them about that. Um, and they'll be joining us in just a little bit. You know, courage doesn't always roar. Sometimes it's just a small voice inside that says, I'll try again tomorrow. I know some of you in the audience may be facing an uphill battle. I hope that you will be encouraged today. The word encourage has in its root courage. And it literally means to lend courage to someone else right? The courage to face another day. So thank you. I hope you do find courage in our, in our speakers today. We've got uh, Senator Sherry Buckney, Buckner Webb, who is just a delight and you're going to enjoy her. And we've got our very own uh, Alana Matthews that will be coming in. Um, she's candidate for Sacramento County District Attorney. Uh, so stay with us. They'll be joining us in just a bit. I am Gail Guest Brown. I am the CEO and executive leadership coach of Guest Brown Impact. I offer one-on-one -on -one leadership development services for women who are facing challenges to equity. I do uh, leadership, uh, leadership development courses. Oh yes, and our vision, how could I forget this? Um, the reason why I even started my practice was to support women. women and women of color who are at the very short end of the equity equation. Our vision is women standing in their power, speaking their truths and commanding their world. I think you'll see today that our guest speakers are those women, all right? So thank you so much. I will... Um, I was talking about my offering. So I offer one-on-one -on -one coaching. I offer leadership development courses and I do DEIB courses for companies who are facing challenges to equity as well. I also have an, I'm an author. We'll be giving away one of my books today, Girl, Get It Right. Um, and that will definitely encourage you if you're in an uphill battle. And then also I'm a speaker, but that has been challenging during COVID. So, you know, I just want you to know I'm vaxxed and boosted. I'm ready to go. So uh, definitely check me out on my website. Please drop my link to my website so they can find me there and my links. But I do want to talk to you about uh, the fact that March, you know, it's spring. And it is, you can see the tulips blooming behind me. It's definitely spring. And um, March is a lot of things. So I'm gonna share a few slides with you if you don't mind, just for a minute, because uh, friend, uh, Terry, if you will bring those slides up, we'll talk about the fact that March is a lot of things. Next slide. It is Women's History Month. Some people are calling this Women's Futures Month. It's uh, Gender Equality Month. We should call it Gender Inequality Month, but it's, a, it's so that we, stay aware that there are a lot of inequities facing us. And March 8th was International Day of the Woman and March 4th is Equal Pay Day. We'll talk a little bit about Equal Pay Day in just a minute. Next slide, please. I wanna celebrate uh, the victory that the US soccer team had. You know, this, this was huge. It took them three years to do this. They band together and they sued uh, the, the soccer league. They were making, they were doing the same job as the men's soccer team. They were more victorious than they were. Uh, and yet they were paid a fraction of the men's soccer team. So this is a victory for all of us. They won $24 million, uh, some of that in back pay as well. And uh, this is just huge. It's to be celebrated, right? Um, next slide, please. I want to talk a little bit about pay inequities. So 
pay, race, and pay inequity. Next slide. So Equal Pay Day is a symbolic day, but it's a, there to remind us that our how much inequity they are in our pay, in our paychecks. And so on average, if we if we average all women, we average about a little less than 20% uh, less than men, but it adds up. So over the course of the year, all women have to work until about March 15th. This is a 2021 slide because they haven't calculated the 22 data yet, but on average till March this year, March 15th to earn what men did uh, last year. You can see that black women have to work until March to earn what their white male counterparts act, earn. Uh, Native American women till September and Latino women till October. Every year this inches up, but just minimally. Only Asian American women earn more than all women and there's still inequities there. So um, this is something we still need to press forward and, and deal with. You know, these uh, inequities, whether they're race and, and gender are, are the challenge of our generation. Next slide. Here is the pay gap by state. We're all about in the same place, but you can see New York and Vermont are doing the best where Utah and Wyoming are doing the least, <laughs> right? And so the, the lighter the color, uh, the further they are from the median and the darker, the, they're the, the best side of the, the, the good side of the median. So just something to keep in mind, you know, it's important that we continue to negotiate at salary time you know, on average, men are prepared to negotiate for more than women are, and that needs to change. We need to be bolder. Maybe you can get a, a, a leadership coach to help you negotiate next time you have to do salary negotiations. Next slide. These dollars, this percentage, it adds up over time. Over a 40-year career, Latino women will lose a million dollars, over a million, as will Native women and Black women just under a million. Uh, and you can see Asian Pacific women still lose 400K and white women 500K. So these inequities are, are stubborn, but we are the generation that can fix this. We have more knowledge than any other generation before us. Next slide. These gender and racial inequities are the leadership challenge of our generation. And we are the generation that can fix this. Enough of these slides. Let's get back to the program. I'd love to bring up. I'd love to um, to bring up Sherry Buckner Webb. And so, um, let me. Uh, are we going to bring Sherry into the? Okay, thank you. Yeah, she. Um, I know Sherry. Before all this fame and fortune, she was we we our cross our past cross at HP, and uh, we were both working at HP at the time. She's a retired Idaho state legislator. Let's go ahead and bring Sherry into the into the room. Can we bring Sherry up? Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, Sherry. How are you? I'm wonderful. So happy to be with you. Thank you. Let me do a little bit of introduction and then you can tell me what I left off. Sherry is a retired Idaho state legislator. She's a small business owner. She's nationally recognized consultant and she's the founder and principal of Sojourner Coaching. She's a fifth generation Idahoan and a certified professional coach. She is also a highly respected speaker. She, she raises her voice and awareness in a myriad of arenas, including purpose, justice, human rights, leadership, civic responsibility, and cultural competence. One thing I was shocked to find out is that Sherry is an accomplished vocalist. Mm -hmm. So if we run out of time today, if we, we have, don't have enough time, she might even sing a song for us. That would be awesome. She earned her BS in management and organizational leadership from George Fox University 
and an MSW from with an emphasis in management from Northwest Nazarene University. Her credo is to leave a legacy. Well, I don't think there's any doubt that she's done that. Sherry is the first African-American legislator in the state of Idaho. In fact, she's the first female legislator in the state of Idaho. And she um, has served some time, I think two years in the legislature and three terms in the Senate. I want to welcome Sherry to us. This is a woman who knows something about courage. Mm -hmm. I was reading her background online. Tell me what I left out in your background, Sherry. Well, I'm so proud of my time in the legislature. I'm not the first woman, but I'm the first black and the first black woman. Okay. And I will tell you that I served a total of 10 years in the legislature. Um, I don't know what you're leaving out. You were so generous to me. I appreciate it. But I guess I would say, particularly in honor of all the women that are on this, this um, call, as well as the men, they need to know this, that women have to walk in the world courageous every day. And it's, it's through that camaraderie that I have with other women that support me and I support them. And we can do great things together if we use that, that as a catalyst for what we do. I've had a great life and I plan to keep on. I, I've gotten so bold that I'm finally admitting my mother would roll over in her grave that I'm 70. She always said, don't ever tell your age. But I think that's another era, another opportunity for us to support each other by saying every age is a productive, great age for us as women. Awesome. Thank you so much. I love that. You are such a bold warrior. I remember reading a little bit about your history and growing up in Idaho. I know a little bit about Boise, right? It is. It is. Uh, what percentage? With all respect, it's Lily White. <laughs> <laughs> right? One percent of the population in the entire state is, is uh, African-American or Black. And so that took some bold, that's some courage to run in Idaho, right? I also heard, I, I read a little bit about your family's history in Idaho. And I, yeah. I don't know if you want to share a little bit about that. That's where right. the courage comes from. That's exactly yeah. where it comes. Yeah. My, when my mother's family came here from Arkansas. When they chose Idaho, I kept saying, what are you guys lost in the desert? What is it? But it was right immediately following one of the largest lynchings of black people in Arkansas, not far from where they left. And so they were motivated to move. One daughter had already moved here with her husband that was um uh, Pullman Porter. And uh, she saw another black man that was um, in, uh, gainfully employed and called her older sister and said, you need to come too. And then that terrible situation happened. And one by one, my family came one by one. Many came with, with an uncle or somebody that was a porter. My grandfather and two uncles were the last that came and they hopped on a, on a train, which was against the law and, and hoboed out here, got to Salt Lake and they got taken off the train and told you know, we're going to lock you up, blah, blah, blah. And my grandfather was a mighty man and he prayed and he prayed with a plum. And so did his, I mean, they, they had it going on, you know, they prayed loud. So the jailers yeah. could hear him and the jailer was so touched. He said, I'm going to let you go, but don't you get on a train. And they said, I promise and bless your brother, bless you. And they walked All down right the street now? and jumped on another train and came <laughs> to Idaho and brought the rest. The other side of the family came here through uh, my grandfather that was a minister and was called, he said, to preach. You, you all know that are African-American on the call, was called to preach in, um, to found a church in Pueblo, Colorado. And then after that, he said he was called to Idaho. So we all feel that it was a calling because we figure no black person in their right mind would have come to Idaho. So that courage that I talk about and the women that were with them all the way, it had to take courage to come there and a long faith tradition too, but it had to be courageous. I think I might've left both those husbands coming out here. I'm not sure. <laughs> but I do love Idaho and it's been great for our family and for us to stay for five generations. And I have two sons and a granddaughter. So yet we are here seven generations. Awesome. Awesome. So, so inspiring to hear that story. I, I read a story about a cross burning on your front lawn. Is that, is that my parents? I, I now live nine blocks, eight blocks from where my parents live. When we moved, um, to the North and we moved out of what was the predominantly black area. And even at that, the numbers were less, there were less, fewer black people than there were white people. Mm -hmm. We moved out to a really nice neighborhood. I mean, considering, and a cross was burned in our yard. After we'd been there about a year, I think I was about six. And uh, my mom, we're all having dinner. My mom has this vision that something's going on. She jumps out, looks out, says to my dad, there's a fire in our front yard. He realizes it's across the street. He, he, they all think it's across the street. He runs out, puts the thing out and uh, 
immediately starts to dismantle it. And my mother's the courageous one. She said, with all due respect, I'll clean up the language. The SOBs are late. We've been here a year. We're not moving and we're not moving the cross. Leave it on the front porch so they can see us. My mother was an unbelievably courageous woman. Everybody in the family that lived here wanted us to move. They wanted our, the children. I had an older brother and a younger sister to go elsewhere. We didn't. We stayed. We stayed the course. And I think that was the first really, really, really visible uh, sign, symbol of me in the course because it's the right thing to do and not walking in fear. I'm not saying that they weren't nervous or concerned, but not to let fear rule you. Mm, awesome. Moving to, despite of the fear, right? Mm -hmm. Moving through the fear, right? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you so much. So let's talk about you a little bit more. That is an incredible history, but at seven years old to have that happen and still to grow up and 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 have the courage knowing who who your your constituents are, right? Yeah. Knowing who they are, to have the courage to run. Where did you get that? Well, I will tell you, there were no black people in my neighborhood. My brother and I walked way the heck and back to get to a neighborhood that there were black kids in the in the school system. Um, my mom was a troublemaker. She was a professional troublemaker. My dad had grown up here. He was a good old boy that played basketball and all that kind of stuff. I mean, he was the only one in his neighborhood. His He had the, the beauty of having his father having been the pastor. He had cachet a little bit, if you will. Yeah. So I think that some of that provided us a little bit of comfort, but um, courage, I don't know if you you're, are really cognizant of courage until you're presented with something. Mm -hmm. And I knew I was the only, but my mother used to talk about it when I was a kid, it's a competitive advantage or it can be to your deficit. She said, you can be the smartest kid and be the black kid, or you can be the one that's left behind and be the black kid. And I want my kids to do the best. Mm -hmm. And so I, it's that Dorothy Buckner thing that kept pushing us. And we had, like I said, we were surrounded by family. And my grandfather Johnson says, there's no half-assed, there's only full-on. I hate to use that language. I shouldn't have done that, but I just talked about the vernacular at the time. Mm -hmm. The expectation was there. When I was very young, in my teens, um, all of the conversation about, there was still, you couldn't move. Well, let me just say that just this week, we finally got um, legislation moved that I tried to bring before, that Black folks can live almost any place in any neighborhood because there were still covenants that prohibited us. Mm. So actually, I think the first few years they rented intentionally because somebody didn't want to sell to us. The guy said, you got to give me protection, the one that was going to sell it to us mm. by renting for a period of time. But anyway, um, a lot of the civil rights legislation that took part, which wasn't a lot, it was during the time of Martin Luther King, took part in our living room. White folks, black folks, legislators, friends, mm. confidants, people my dad went to school with. And the first civil rights um, march after Martin, Link, Martin Luther King died, they weren't going to uh, lower the flag to half mast. And so we had our first civil rights uh, civil rights act of civil dis disobedience, I would say here. And I will tell you, there were more white folks present than black folks, but we were there. Wow. All right. More white folks. Black folks were afraid they would lose their jobs. They were told they would. There were tons of police all over the place, but we stood we, and, and we did it. And so having grown up in that kind of environment, my dad was the first uh, black man on the Human Rights Commission. And uh, there was just, I grew up in that environment. So to run for office was not a big challenge. Wow, that's amazing that that that's not a big challenge. I, I think it's scary now and I don't have half the challenges of the environment that, that you had. You know, we talked about the four C's, courage, commitment, character, and cash. Which two or three of these are most important to you on your journey to hold office? Well, I would think the least important to me, the three are pretty equal. The other three is cash, because, you know, if you're ready to run, you, you can go ask somebody for cash. The only thing they can tell you is no. But you, your, your opportunity is to explain why you are the right person to run. And I have been asked to run on both sides of the aisle. I'm very definitely the Democrat. I kept saying, you got to be confused because my dad was the nice guy. But, I'm, but I have been asked to run because the opportunity is that you can speak for um, a cadre of people that aren't heard. And I'm not talking only about black people. I'm talking about women. I'm talking people of a certain socioeconomic background that if you're a truth speaker and you've been known to be a truth teller, and they may not like what you're telling. That truth telling can get you a long, long way, a long way. 
I could always raise some cash. I'd had great experience for church. Anybody has gone to church has raised cash That's or nonprofits. Right. And I've been part of nonprofits, courage, commitment, and character. And people will judge your character by what you do and what you don't do. So you have to show up. I, I created this little thing called Cherie seven ups when I was very young, it was stand up, show up fully demonstrating who you are. Speak up, tell the truth, know when to shut up. That's a real, it's one I have to work on from time to time and be ready to make up, re-up and always look up. Oh, I those love those. Get me over. I love those. Those are Sherry's seven ups. ups. Seven <laughs> ups. All right. Awesome. I used it in the legislature even to get elected. Let me tell you. Awesome. I would love that. I'd love those. So Sherry, what did you do to prepare to lead? What leadership training is possible or necessary in, pre in pre preparation to run for office? I think everybody looks to seeing something that they've gone to a class or read or whatever. Those are absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. But also turn to the people that you admire, people in your family. You'll hear me, hear, hear me invoke my grandparents from time to time. Oh. I, I will. I mean, my grandfather used to say we go for rides on, the, on Sunday afternoon. We didn't have many. That's what we did. We went for rides. And he sees some little um, outhouse in the field and say, Sherry, buy property buy property. He called me Cherry all the time, drove me crazy. Cherry. And as I grew older, one of the first things I did, even after I got divorced and had children, was to buy a house. And then to buy another really, 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 really humble house, I learned how to paint and 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 repair things, put windows in, all kinds of things. Personally, listen to those that you admire and respect and hear their words. They may not come to fruition now, mm. but later. I think it's listening to the elders, listening and, and looking for people that you respect and to follow suit. Awesome, thank you. When I look at public office, it looks hard to me. Are there intrinsic or extrinsic benefits that I might not see as an outsider? You mean a value proposition to, to run for office? Yes. Well, we are all endowed with, with certain special gifts. And if we can, if we can endow the future mm -hmm. by speaking for those that might not be heard, that those that can't speak for themselves, and even benefiting ourselves that we're doing it, it's it's an amazing, heady, scary, and it and it even pushes you forward because. Maybe you might not have the zeal for a certain issue, but you know that there are others that do and they're counting on you. It gives you more courage, I believe, to go and talk to them and to understand what their frame of reference is. And again, to stand up, speak up and know that there are those that are counting on you. Awesome. It's an amazing, heady, scary place to be <laughs> from that standpoint. All right. All right. Uh, I, I what I what I what what really stood out for me is endowing the future. I hadn't Oof. thought about it that way, That's right? Future. What better way to endow the future than to run for office and put our stamp there, right? And it also takes the legacy that your family gave you, yeah. your your family of birth or the family of your community. You also do for them. We make the future. It doesn't happen by itself or it can by itself and we can be left out. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I love it. Thank you so much. That was so inspiring. You know, I happen to know that I, the reason why I was able to reconnect to you is I saw a LinkedIn ad where they had uh, celebrating the fact that you have a park named after you. Now. I still can't get over it. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> happy. What a legacy. Can we show a picture of Sherry's Park? <laughs> Sherry Look at Buckley. that pink tree out there. <laughs> Isn't that beautiful? That's a metal tree, right? It is. It's unbelievable. And when they said pink, I go, I'm not some little Femi girl. And as it grew and, and, and was uh, erected, it's just an amazing, amazing work of art. It is amazing work of art. I saw a picture of you and your husband standing underneath the tree. Ah. Yeah, it was beautiful. Um, I hadn't even noticed that tree, but I, I see it. I see it now that I saw it in the picture. When I first saw it, I just saw the the the, the statue there. And yeah. I guess it's on 1100 West Bannock. 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 It's the cornerstone of the tree. It's a small tree right down the only park in downtown Boise. And it's become such a gathering place. I'm so grateful for that. It means Do you know why they picked that spot, Sherry? 
Well, actually, the spot was selected a lot many, many years ago, and it never came to fruition. And uh -huh. there are a whole cadre of people that came together. And then this, the, the, here's the thing. Um, the city of Boise, not the entity, but people in Boise were able to submit names on who they wanted it named for. And then there was a vote. And I, held, I, I, I never imagined I sent my I sent names in myself that wasn't mine. But I'm just really blown away, especially to be a black woman in Idaho. It meant quite a bit to me. So it's for all of us. Oh, thank you so much. I have never known anybody who had a park name after them while they were living. Right? That's what I said, too. Right. Yeah. My, my kids didn't have to give money or anything. Yeah, right? right. They're living. So this is amazing. It's an amazing accomplishment. So kudos to you. Thank you're, you. You're so, so earned, so well-deserved. Um, it's just inspiring to talk to you. Uh, I understand you're also an author. Is that true? Um, I am. I am. I'm not uh, not books yet. I'm doing uh, offerings to a lot of different um contributing to a lot of things. Um, I, do you know that's one of the things that I love? And I hope the women that are on here in particular, there's so many opportunities for us, even with babies, even with husbands, even with all the other things that we do, we can still do the thing that gives our spirit wings. That's all just right now? huge, huge, huge. Oh. I worked in timber and wood products. Listen, the first day I was in the in the sawmill, somebody took me around the sawmill to see how it works. Yeah, I know how you cut a tree. I know you have to cut it down. You move it. And uh, the um, manager was standing behind me and they were starting to bring a log in. And the guy that's the the um, sawyer, the one that runs the controls that cuts the log, I saw his ears turn bright red. And I thought something's up. And he goes and the log comes down this conveyor. And then he goes and then and then. And then the, the manager says, shut it down. We've got to go inside. So he took me inside his office and he said, well, I don't know how to tell you this, I, but, but the next piece of equipment is called the nigger. And I said, and what does the nigger do? And he said, the nigger turns the log. And I said, in order for me to support this, um, this sawmill in the future, you'll be calling it the log turner or you're not going to get no parts to support this thing. Right. So he so many things are in the vernacular. Oh my goodness! Business around the world, it was not, and, and I and I felt pretty proud of myself. And I didn't, I didn't lose my voice. It just, I mean, I'm surrounded. What am I going to do? I said, in the future, if you'd like support for the mill, we'll be calling that the log turner. So one of the things that I think that women bring to the workplace, no matter no matter where it is, we learn to be creative and innovative. We learn to choose our words. Um, I don't know that we all feel confident to do that, but our creativity and the uniqueness that we bring, I could have acted a fool. What would that have been? Which is kind of what men do. They kind of brush up against each other. Some, not all men. Yeah. But we bring a whole new uh, way of being into whatever workplace we've been. When I worked in an aviation division, I helped order a plane from France, from Dassault, and they took deliver of this plane. I felt like hot stuff. And I'd been doing stuff on the phone with them. And, and because my name was Cherie, they thought, oh, French, ha ha. And, and the guy came and they said, oh, I want you to meet Cherie. And he goes, oh, you're so tall. I'm not tall, folks. <laughs> You're so and I beautiful. just said, thank you. I mean, we know what he meant. Oh, I didn't know you was black. Yeah. So it's kind of funny. Women bring a sensibility that allows them to almost on auto automatic pilot know what to do. And I think that's a great strength for us. By the same token, we can show overt strength. But I'm so proud to be a woman. And I think that all those things, when you talk about the legislature or any business I've been in, serves us well. Awesome. Thank you so much. Cherie, is that the way I should have been pronouncing your name? Oh, my mother had a French thing going. My brother is Charles. I'm Cherie. My Charlie. next sister's Paulette. And the bonus baby's Carol. <laughs> Cherie. All right, well, Cherie. She can do it. I don't do it. I say Cherie. You do, Cherie. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for joining us today. I am going to say farewell for now. Thank I'm, you. I might bring you back in, so don't go anywhere. Okay, I'll, I'll be listening. Okay. Today and every day. Thank you. I, thank I you. think I think our next guest is Alana Matthews, and she would love to hear a word of a word of wisdom from you. I'll bring you back in as you think about that. A word of okay. wisdom thank to you. her as she give started. her my very best just to start. Thank you. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Um, next up, stay with us. We're gonna do a 
we're going to do a drawing and then we're going to then we're going to have alana come up okay so we've got a couple of things um thank you my my staff has been working hard My staff has been working hard and and we have a winner, okay? We have some things to give away uh, and we're gonna give away my book today. And the winner is Jennifer Arstein. Thank you, Jennifer, for joining us. And I hope you will read Girl, Get It Right and pass it along. One, one of the reasons I wrote a book is they have legs. And so uh, they can encourage you, but they can encourage a girlfriend later as well. So keep that book in rotation. And um, our next guest, I'm gonna bring up our next guest. We do have another giveaway I'll give away at the end because I have a special thing I wanna do for that one. Let's bring up, um, Oh my goodness, where is Alana's paperwork? Here we go. Alana Matthews is joining us from Yosemite today. She's the founding director of Community Justice Collaborative, a grassroots all volunteer project which focuses on criminal justice solutions that are community centered and healing informed. Alana began, began her career as a deputy DA where she worked her way up to misdemeanor intern, prosecuting domestic violence, drug, juvenile, delinquency, and serious felony crimes. She was then recruited to start the enforcement unit for the California Energy Commission, and the following year was appointed by Governor Brown to be the public attorney for that agency. She has transformed the agency's outreach programs by prioritizing the inclusion of immigrant, undocumented, indigenous, and non-English speaking communities. Alana has served in a lot of different capacities. After that role, she was the chief consultant with the California legislator, where she provided oversight to the California's climate change policies and programs. She's drafted staff and staff solutions, resolutions, legislation, and budgets requests. In addition to that, she served as an adjunct professor at McGeorge School of Law. Last year, Alana returned to the field of criminal justice as the director of policy resources, training, and membership for the Prosecutors Alliance of California. So Alana has been doing a lot of things. She's an implicit bias trainer, anti-racist and restorative justice facilitator and certified BIPOC public participation consultant for government agencies. I want to know about, more about that, Alana. Um, and over the past five years, she's led racial reconciliation town halls and healing circles for the city of Elk Grove to address anti-Black and anti-Asian hate crimes and hate incidents. She earned her Bachelor's of Arts degree in philosophy from Spelman College and her JD and Master's of Law in Government Affairs and Public from the U University of Pacific McGeorge School of Law. She's served on many uh, boards and direct and co-chairs. I'll bring her up to talk a little bit about that. But one of the things I saw in her bio is that she, in 2022, was a top black change maker uh, from Sacramento and Sacramento Bees 22, 2022, top black, 25 black change makers. Uh, she, Wiley Manual Bar Association attorney for the year and the Law Pathwords diversity champion. There are so many awards. She's been the National Bar's uh, award for 40 under 40, the SAC Business Journal for 40 under 40. This is a well uh, awarded woman. Uh, she's She received the uh, um, Ewok Award, Exceptional Women of Color. The same year at SME, she was on the podium with me. That's not our first place we met, but I was happy to share the podium with her. One of the secrets that I didn't know about Alana, maybe other people knew, is she's an actress. 
and she's performed with the Celebration Arts Community Theater in Sacramento. She's married to retired uh, United States Army First Sergeant and the proud mother of four amazing children. Wow, Alana, that is a lot. Let's bring Alana on. Thank you for joining us. How are you? I am doing well. Thank you for having me. Awesome, awesome. Were you able to hear a little bit from Sherry Buckner Webb? Uh, yes, yes, I was right. able, enjoyed her story. And that she has a park named after her. That's awesome. Yeah, <laughs> awesome, right? That's, the, that's in your path, that's on your way, right? That's coming up for you. It was so pleased to see you, all the things you do in the community, Alana, and just Thank to you. know that our paths have crossed a number of couple of times. Once in the DV field when you were, when I was working in domestic violence and you were in the DA's office, we sat together on that committee, then our paths crossed again at EWOC. And look at you now, just sailing on, doing your thing. I'm so happy to have you to so talk about yourself, your platform, what you hope to promote for, what you want to do with this, uh, this run for um, Sac County DA. What's your plans? What's your vision? Absolutely. So, you know, I'd just like to start with the fact that I grew up in Gary, Indiana, which is one of the murder capitals of this country. A lot of crime. It was so bad that uh, one night my youth group and I, we were at my pastor's house and someone did a random drive by shooting. Mm -hmm. So that type of random violence where you just target uh, a bunch of church kids is is very reflective of what it was. But, you know, after that happened, um, we were all safe. Nobody called the police. You know, my parents kind of told me, like, listen, the only way to have a better life is to get good grades and go to college. So I listened and ultimately I got accepted into a college prep school. And I was walking around campus one day, right, because I've started this bright new future at this college prep school. And I was accosted by a truckload of guys who called me the N word, the B word and told me to go back to Africa. Mm. So I was like running for my life. Like, is this 1990 or 1950? And got back to campus, burst through the doors in tears, out of breath, told them what happened to me. And they said, uh, you shouldn't have been walking by yourself. No, it's your fault. It's your fault, right? Where exactly. were you? Exactly. Where were you? What city? I was, on the camp I was on the campus of Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. Oh. So I learned two things that day. Number one, I may not be safe no matter where I live. Mm -hmm. And number two, the criminal justice system may not be available to me because no one called the police, not even filed an incident report. Mm -hmm. So one of the reasons why I'm running for DA and what I hope to accomplish is to make everybody feel safe where they live, work, raise their family, and make sure that our criminal justice system is available to everyone. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm so I'm so proud of you for having the courage to run. Where did it come from? Where does this courage come from, Alana? <laughs> you know, um, I, I, I've just always been a person who is uh, a problem solver. Um, I saw my parents, you know, they were both union members. They grew up fighting for what's right, better working conditions, better wages, better opportunities. Um, and so for me, I think just being around that, when you see something, my mom would say, if you're not a part of the solution, you're a part of the problem. So I think I just always wanted to be a part of the solution. Um, and that is just, you know, I mean, my parents were both kind of the rebel rousers in the union. So like they didn't care what it cost. Right is right. And so I think that kind of fearlessness just passed on to me. Um, and I looked in 2020 and saw our criminal justice system was failing, right? Because that was the summer of Breonna Taylor, Maude Arbery, yes. George Floyd. And here locally in California, you know, we had a proposition that was on the ballot that I felt like was taking us in the wrong direction, which was really trying to uh, criminalize theft and making it so that the third time someone commits a petty theft, it's only $250 and you go to prison. Now, I don't know about you, but when I think of prison, I think of like rapers, you know, rapists, murderers, robbers, things, things really serious crime. I don't think of someone who just stole, you know, something, especially when you're in a pandemic and people are, you know, being challenged financially. So I could tell that we were going in the wrong direction. And it doesn't mean that, you know, you don't have accountability for thefts, but the type of accountability, you know, where we just want to equate accountability with punishment or we want to equate justice with punishment that wasn't working so i looked around to see if somebody else would run nobody wanted to so i said okay i'm gonna run and it just it just came out of necessity of fixing a broken criminal system awesome awesome i see you also um are a restorative justice facilitator 
Yes. Right. And so uh, are you, what do you hope to do with restorative justice as you, especially as it, as it applies to petty theft, right? Yeah. So I, I will say this, I think in, in a broader context, um, one of the reasons why I want to run is because for too long we have reacted to crime. And I think we can't just react to crime because all the harm has happened. We need to have prevention and intervention strategies so crime doesn't happen in the first place. And restorative justice is a very, very good model to achieving that. And the reason why is because you're asking the person who has caused harm to do three things. One, acknowledge that harm. Two, try to repair that harm. And three, commit to not having or doing future harm. Right. So when you just kind of react to it and you sentence somebody, they're going to jail or they're going to prison, they just sit there, right? The only thing they really have to do to escape it is just kind of avoid punishment, but it's just kind of passive. The real work comes in that sort of deep reflection, and that's what restorative justice does. It's not always possible to have the offender connect with the person who has been harmed, but in the cases where you're able to do that, um, it's very powerful, and that type of deep reflection, even in the most, um, you know, people who look at it like, mm, I don't think, I, you know, they're, they're skeptics about it. They really don't want to participate. Um, engaging in that is not only helpful for victims because their voice gets to be centered. When you think of the regular criminal trial process, they're just passively like, OK, come into court and testify. But you really don't have anything else to say. Maybe you get to say a victim impact statement. But in restorative justice, you're centering the voice of the person who has been harmed to say, this is what I feel like I need to be made whole again. And then you have the offending party who's going to commit to that. And I hope to bring that to our criminal justice system. So when you have someone who's stealing, maybe they don't appreciate the consequences. They're just thinking about themselves like this is what I need. I can make quick money if I resell this or I don't have means or opportunities. But when you start to reflect you can look at other resources, like how can you meet that need or how can you see the consequences of your actions? How is that going to impact other people? So that type of reflective um, practice and exercise really helps people make better decisions. It builds their critical thinking skills. And then lastly, I think, I think it's a model that can go beyond criminal justice. Some of the restorative justice practices that I've done have been in the employment context. I mean, how many people have left a job under bad circumstances, right? right. Um, and that's just the end of it. But I've been fortunate enough to have a client who actually we work with reconciliation of, um, you know, them being able to have a continued relationship with that organization because they were able to come together, kind of acknowledge the harm and the way uh, she left the organization, uh, do what she asked to repair the harm. And then they move forward to making sure they don't harm anyone like that in the future. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. I'm, I'm a fan of restorative justice uh, yes. for, for some crimes. So thank you. And so, um, you know, we talked about the four C's, courage, commitment, character, mm -hmm. and cash. Which two or three of those are most important on your journey to hold public office? I think courage, <laughs> um, because I am running against a machine. So, I mean, it takes a lot of courage to run. And I think it's something that everybody, number one, should do. But um, you're tested, you know, every single day. Um, and it's, it's very challenging when um, there, there are lies being told about you, right? There's misrepresentation because how do you defend that? Usually, you know, there's some level of truth. If someone goes back and tells a story, you're like, oh, let me clarify. But when there's just straight up a misrepresentation, so you have to be able to withstand that. You have to be comfortable in who you are and letting your character speak for yourself. So courage, not just in getting in front of people, um, not calling people, just asking them for money, but really having, um, you know, the courage to just withstand the fight. I like to, to liken my race to David and Goliath. And, you know, we hear that story and we're all pumped up. But, you know, until you stood in front of a giant yeah. and you look all the way up and you're like, OK. Um, and then I would say a character. That's the other part, because during this process, you could easily lose yourself. Um, you know, I will not say cash, but I think some people do that because they're looking for the donations because they think money is how you're going to win, which money is a very important part of viability. But you can't let that dictate and center to who you are. So I think for me, it's been courage and it's been character. And character. Awesome. Well, uh, both of our speakers today uh, are courageous women in their own right. Sherry Buckner Reb said something that really stuck with me is about endowing the future. Uh, you know, when you run for office, right? That you are actually attempting to touch the future and to shape the future with these runs for office, right? 
So tell us a little bit about your campaign. What do you want to do when you become the DA of the Sacramento County? Yeah, one of the main things I want to do is open up our criminal legal system because on the campaign trail, I've found that there's so many people who aren't getting justice. There's so many people who have called. Um, they haven't heard anything. I mean, I was in Dollar Tree last week and I met a young lady who said she had been assaulted and had not heard from a detective or a DA or anyone. And I apologize for, I hope the background is distracting. We, we yeah. thought we had moved to a, a spot That's where true. it would not be a lot of traffic. So let me see if I can just turn this way. Maybe that might be a little bit better. I don't want that to be too distracting. Yeah, but um, I'd, like to, I'd like to focus on what you're saying. Thank you. OK. Yeah. yeah. So um, we're still getting let's just go this way. Sorry. OK. So one of the um, the things that I hope to do is open up our criminal legal system, because so many people, I mean, they don't call the police, maybe because they've had a bad experience or maybe they're immigrants and they come from a country where the police have been very corrupt. But at any point, we have so many people in our society who are being harmed and just feel like it's normalized. So I just have to deal with it. So I want to open that up and not so much have people come to me like with an advisory board. But I think the DA ought to have a presence in the community. The DA needs to understand how people experience safety and what safety really needs to that. Because I think the role, obviously, it is to seek justice in criminal cases, but it's also the work to prevent crime. And so the way we do that is understanding the community. So that's one of the things that I hope. The other two things that I hope, which is something near and dear to both of our hearts, is to address the increased violence against women. Um, we had an unfortunate incident that just happened in the Sacramento community where, unfortunately, you know, a dad murdered his three children during a custody visit um, and himself and the chaperone. Um, and so that speaks to not only the tragedy, with when someone, a woman gets a restraining order and you know the, the abuser still is able to get access to guns. But it also speaks to the, the, um, the level of distrust or unbelief that women of color face when they say, I am afraid and I am in, in fear for my life that the system will still allow this person who put her in fear to be around children. So I definitely want to address that. And I don't want to ignore the disparities that exist for women of color. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Alana. I'm so proud of you. I'm so glad you're going to be our next DA. I'm, 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 I'm praying about that. I, I'm, I'm calling it. Um, but I also want to bring up Sherry uh, Webb before we, we break from you. I, I, want to, I want to give you an opportunity for you two to connect. I think you could borrow some of her courage as well as you run. And so um, can we drop this banner and, and come in three up, please? Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. And Sherry, I asked you to think about advice uh, you might give to Alana as she pursues this yes. run for office. Well, I'm going to tell you, I think Alana's got it going on. I want to tell people in the community, <laughs> people get ready. <laughs> There's a train that come in and she's ready to go. And all I right. hope they'll step up with their dollars and their quarters and all of that and get registered to vote and vote. My thing is just keep the faith. And if you need a little TLC, give me a call. I'll send you my number. I mean, I'm just saying, because it's, it's it's hard. My, my yes. oh girl, girl. You got a yes. whole cadre of people listening to you today that know what you're talking about. I just want to say amen. 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 Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, ooh, listen. Wee. Oh, ooh, we Sherry. Thank <laughs> you. Sherry, thank you. Thank you for that. Song. Uh, can, can we cue the organ right now? I know, right? <laughs> can we get some more of that going? That was beautiful. <sighs> awesome. Awesome. Listen, I want to say while we have neither one of these guests mentioned cash, <laughs> neither one of them mentioned cash, ads, but we know it takes money to run. And so I want to uh, offer up a hundred dollars and I'd love for one of our guests to match me. I've got a special gift for the first person to match me on, on social media. Uh, I've got a, some ear pods, some Tozy ear pods and a charging station. Uh, so uh, you guys check out the social media. Who's going to match me? You have to say, I match that hundred dollars. I match that hundred dollars. <laughs> All right. All right. Cherie. I hear you. Thank you. Anybody else on social media? We got anybody else matching? I need bring it, girls. Bring it. Bring it now. I need some cash for Alana. She's got to make bring this it. run. 
And we don't want her thinking about money. We don't want her thinking about it at all. But we know it's a reality. It is. Thank you so much for doing that. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, one of the things I've said is that, um, you know, having that that character, I am not accepting money from law enforcement associations. So I think for the DA, that's a particular conflict of interest. Oh, so, Anise Porter. Oh, yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank and you. And even you after are, the show is over, yeah. I know I'm taking over your show. Even after the show is over, you can still match. That's Send right. Money. Right. Yeah, Amana, that's right. do we have your uh, campaign information to drop in the chat? You know what? We should have it in there. Um, I'm not in a place where I can type it, but it's alana4da.com forward slash A, or you can just go to alana4da.com. There is a link that says contribute. Alana, F-O-R-D-A.com. A-L-A-N-A-F-O-R-D-A.com. Okay. One of our folks back, back our, our production team should be able to do that. Drop that in the link. Let's get... All right. Oops. No, that's me. Let's get a lot of uh, contact information up there. Thank you. Thank, well, thank you. you. I am so, uh, so pleased. Anything you want to share with us, uh, Sherry or Alana about courage and anything, you know, there, there are many women out there fighting an uphill battle. I have a friend, uh, Nisi, who chooses to live with cancer. She's not dying with cancer. She's living with cancer, right? And so any words of encouragement uh, that we can give to our guests that might help them? Your stories are encouraging. Don't get me wrong. They are awesome. But do we have anything? I would, I would just say that we all, as Black women, have a legacy of, you know, knowing Black women, of being a Black woman whose yes. heritage includes Black women, strong Black women. And we have to remember that those Black women born Black babies in the cotton fields, and yet they kept on picking, they kept on praying, and they kept on swinging. And when great God Almighty freed the slaves, ragged, hungry, tormented Black women, the rhythms of Africa still beating in their breasts, scraped and bowed and pinched and saved to send their strong daughters to Piney Woods, Bellman, Philander Smith, to learn to return, to become senators, doctors, lawyers. So whatever we're facing, it's already in our DNA. It's already in our blood to overcome it. We Come have resiliency now. and self-care, but we also have intellect. We have character. We have the, the stick to itness. We have strength that we can use. So we're all building up a whole new legacy. And we're not on the receiving end. It's time for us to step up and take our place so mm. that we pick up the pieces, Woo. face the future, knowing we are destined to leave strong black vibes for strong black sisters to come. So that's my encouragement. Woo, yes. And we also have the opportunity through all that, through all that struggle to honor those sisters that haven't been able to make that transition, but to lift them up with us, bring them on, bring yes. them on. Yes, yes, absolutely a must. Mm. You guys have been, I am just so. Let's go to church, y'all. Let's go to yes. church. Sing us a song. Sing us a song. Yes. Come on now. I tried to help you to succeed. Gave you your wants and supplied all your needs. Each day I pray mm -hmm. that you're okay mm -hmm. in every way. Being all you can be, cause there's so much, so much to learn, and there's so little time before your life slips away. But there is one place you can be safe. Yes, you have a place. In my heart, no matter where you go, no, you're never too far. Come on home. You have a place in our hearts. Wow. Thank you so much. Thank that you. Beautiful. Y'all got me fired up. Thank you, women. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so women. much. We've got another match, y'all. Denise Prescott's matching. Thank you, Denise. Oh, 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 another way. Oh, another match. Yes. Awesome. Awesome, you all. That's where we want to send our matches to. Alana Ford. Thank you. A. What is that? Alana Ford. Alana Ford DA.com. 
Thank you so much. What a beautiful, beautiful way to, to, to end our show. One, another one? Robin Harrington, thank you so thank much. Thank you, Robin. Oh my goodness, thank and you. And if you don't want to send a hundred, send two or five. It's okay. Yes. Or get your Amen. Amen. <laughs> I just thank you for that. I thank you for the sisters that are watching who have donated. What a what a blessing. What a blessing we are. When we come together, we're powerful. When we stand together, nothing can stop us, right? And it's it's important that we remember that, that we can do anything with the support of our friends and our family, right? And our community. So thank you. All right. Well, listen, unless you guys have anything else, we're going to close out. But I, I am, I'm happy to uh, hear anything, any final words. Grateful for you, Gail. I thank just want to so say, much. same here. Thank you. I just want to say thank you for this opportunity. And thank you, Senator, for opening up and making yourself accessible. And thank you to all who are listening. This yeah. is great work. Uh, Alana, I can't wait to come to your park here in Sacramento. <laughs> <laughs> and yours, Gail. And yours, Gail. Yes, yes. I have a little mini park in my backyard. Today. <laughs> <laughs> it's a start. Good start. Good start. You do so many things. All right. All right. Very cool. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and uh, sign off. I think, did we give our, we did our giveaways. Is there anything else we need? I want to thank you for being here, uh, and I want to tell you a little bit about next month. We're going to have, uh, we're not going to come back next month. It's every two months, two months, so we'll be back in May, and um, I'm praying to have a strong panel of, of faith leaders, yes, uh, women yes. faith leaders, so women of faith, extraordinary women of faith, and I'm hoping to have a panel, so you guys pray with me about that. And we'll come back in May to do uh, do the same. So thank you so much for joining us today. I thank you for my friends and family that continue to support the show and all of the followers on Facebook. Know that this will be recorded and out on all of our channels. We're streaming live from LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube right now. So it will be out there recording uh, Alana and Sherry if you want to share that with your friends, you should be able to find that link out there to share with your friends. I thank you for joining me and we're going to sign off for now. I can't wait to talk to my, my guests in the back. So you guys hang in there and I want to talk to each of you uh, and we'll sign off for now. Thank you. Join us. And I'll rise up, rise like the day. I'll rise up, I'll rise unafraid. I'll rise up. And I'll do it a thousand times again